Okay, thank you, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'm going to yeah, present in this conference, the uh, Asian Size Day Circuit Conference. Uh, and my talk will be uh, the, our path design. So I'll begin the talk. Uh, here's today's outline. Uh, so I'll first introduce about uh, the path concept and then uh, introduce why we want to use a path based on the soft oxide breakdown. And then I will discuss about the circuit implementation and then show the, the ex experimental results and then I'll conclude this work. So first let's talk about PATH. Uh, so what is PATH? Uh, it can be seen as a fingerprint of a chip. And how is it the, 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 the how is fingerprint from? It comes from the intrinsic uh, random process variations within the chips. And it can be uh, implemented in various ways and it has uh, various um, a lot of applications. For example, it can be uh, implemented by using SRAMs. Uh, so we can use a power up pattern of the SRAM to give it a random uh, data pattern. Or, or we can use a uh, Renox later to use uh, the, the frequency variation of the, the Renox later to generate random responses. And also there's way to, to use the, the delay difference, delay difference in this kind of circuits to, to make a, a output random data. And what's the, the output of the path is kind of in general like a digital ID uh, with, a, with the unpredictable um, sequence and it can be used in, very, in uh, key generation, entity authentication, uh, I seek anti counterfeiting and also the IP protection and also a lot of uh, different applications. So to show how path works, let's see an example. Uh, let's see an example of uh, a, a path-based key generation. And here we our target, for example, here we want uh, 128 bits of ADS key. And how we're going to achieve? We have first, of course, a, a path a, a thick, a chip fingerprint. And we will need a recall interface to extract the, the, the randomness to, to get the, the path data and bits. So the question would be, can we just uh, take a 128 bit out of these M bits to use as a key. The answer is no, because these bits will be noisy. So we cannot directly use it. We need it to go through a, a one-time one -time enrollment uh, process, which is performed off-chip. And we, we uh, measure the data once, and then consider it's the, the golden data and then put it into the, feed into the helper data algorithm and it would output uh, 128 bits of keys which will be stored in the server and also will store the helper data in the, in the chip, the memory on the chip and later on to extract the key we would uh, perform the error correction and entropy extraction to finally get the 128 bit AES key which will be identical as stored in the server and the parts of these uh, ex making the chip, uh, making the, the, the output stable and have full entropy, we call this post processing. And the question now we need to answer is can we, uh, so yeah, this post processing would need uh, additional circuit and storage, which means extra cost. So we need to answer the questions that can we bypass uh, this part of uh, the post processing? And the answer would be on this part, which is this work uh, we would like to to improve the path property, uh, the path itself to make it uh, intrinsically better. We don't need the, the, the post processing anymore. So before, so how about the good path? Then we show the important path properties. So again, we we have the uh, path and the readout interface. And here we read out the data. And then what's uh, important about this data? It needs to be random, which means it cannot be uh, predicted. So if there's a, a bias in this data, for example, more ones than zeros, it will be easier to predict, so that's what we don't like. And so on, if we read it multiple times, it would introduce errors. So this is treated as a stability, so it wants the output to be stable, as we said before. And for another path, uh, we did a same path with the same circuit. We want it to have a different response, which we call the uniqueness. We want these two different paths to be unique to its, its challenge, so it cannot be cloned by just implementing a new path. 
And of course, then this uh, the stability would be our main focus of this work because our goal is to avoid post processing. To do, so we don't we want a, a really a stable path response. Okay. Uh, so I'll discuss about uh, how why we use oxide breakdown. So the reason is that it's uh, difficult to improve the path stability. So here we shows uh, a distribution of the uh, the process variation. And for for example here, there there is uh, we determine zero and one by determining this uh, at the lower than this threshold value or higher than this threshold values. But the 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 the, 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 the devices locates in the uh, center, it will be affected by noise, so it will not give the stable stable path response. So we. One way is to do the temporary majority voting, which uh, kind of averaging out the noise, so it makes uh, the noise lower, so less uh, the device will be affected. But the, the problem of this one is that it, you cannot cancel out the noise, so you cannot reach 100% stability. And also there's another re way to do it, to, to do the dark bin masking. Now how to do it? It's the, we just you define a certain region which mean which says we don't don't use these kind of devices. But the problem of these cases is we still need a storage element to store the, the mask information. And then there's another technique called burning. It's kind of uh, the ways to stretch the, the distribution. It makes it the left one further left and the right part further right. So. So there will be less uh, devices which is affected by noise. And the problem with this is it's really time consuming. So we will need further improvement. And this, now the solution is that we can use oxide breakdown, which means which uh, is uh, natively stable. And what is oxide breakdown? Then introduce here the we show here a um, transistor which have the, the gate oxide. And the gate oxide is the uh, material of silicon dioxide, which is like an insulator. And in, the, in this uh, silicon dioxide layers, there will be traps. And the row of the traps would kind of help the, the electron to tunnel through. And when we apply the stress on this gate oxide, it will generate more traps. And for some of the traps, they are more aligned together that can form what we call a percolation path, which starts conducting current. And if we leave it for a little while, so then it would grow uh, further, it would grow to a breakdown. And what's important of this breakdown is that because it can be accelerated by voltage, so it can be really fast, less than one second or even microseconds. And also it's not, it's not reversible, so it's stable. It, the, once the breakdown is created, it will only go. And so we have already proposed this uh, breakdown, uh, the path circuit using the oxide breakdown in, in last year. And also there's uh, another uh, paper using a similar concept which is published this year. But there's a difference of these two designs. So in our design it's using soft breakdown and the other is hard breakdown. And what's the difference I will uh, introduce later. And this left one, this, so this work is the follow up of the, our previous work. So let's say uh, why we why we are interested to to use soft breakdown because if there is a concern that when we try to use breakdown as, uh, as to implement a path, there's a doubt that maybe we can see the visually see the breakdown spots, and so there we, we are going to show that soft breakdown are less visible than hard breakdown. So here we first define what is soft breakdown. So as you see here we. First, uh, let the percolation path to grow to a certain level, and here we, we have like more traps formed together, but it still gives our give us a nonlinear non IV characteristic. It's still not like a resistor, but if we let the wear uh, go further without any current limitation, it would uh, goes further to uh, like to melt down to to melt as. Uh, we call it soft hard breakdown. So here it becomes more like a linear IV, like a resistor. And what's the difference? As we can show here in the uh, in some uh, others' work, they, they show a TM image of the soft breakdown and uh, the device with the hard breakdown. As you see, the the left one, which is soft breakdown, there is no uh, uh, signs of the, of uh, damage. 
But for the heart breakdown, you can clearly see there is a silicon epitaxy and also there is substrate damage you see in this device. So it shows that the, the subbreakdown is less visible than heart breakdown. But what is important is that also important is that heart breakdown is already difficult to to observe even using this powerful tool like TEM. But we still want to use subbreakdown because yeah, if the the attack techniques keeps advancing, we can still protect more than the, using the hard breakdown. So now I will explain the, the circuit implementation. Uh, here it shows the puff cell of our design. So it's a puff cell with a self-limiting bad breakdown mechanisms, how it work. So we first we apply the voltage stress, and for a certain time, one of the device would break. For example here, we should, the left one is broken, and it starts to conduct in current. <coughs> Sorry. And as this current conducts, uh, the, the, the PFAX select, select selector at, at top would induce, will have a voltage drop. And this voltage drop, uh, yeah, so this voltage drop would be reduced. Uh, reduce uh, the stress voltage will be reduced, so there uh, the right one would no would have no breakdown, and uh, the left one because the current is also limited, so there will only a uh, soft breakdown that happens in the left transistor. And what's also important is because this uh, this current conducting behavior it's really uh, it happens really fast, so there's. The overlap, uh, the time, the time period is really, really low. So there's a uh, really low probability to have the two breakdown to happen in the same time. And here it shows the the the, uh, the puff structure that we, we used in this design. So we are not only the puff cells, we only also have the the peripheral blocks which uh, controls and read out the data. And the dimension of the, the puff cell is designed to the minimum size, uh, as you see here. And uh, here, the bottom places are the, the, more, the, the important elements, which are the sense amplifier based readout interface, which would help us to detect the breakdown current and uh, to change it to convert it to the digital uh, data. <coughs> and now, talk about how to design the, this readout interface. And first, we need to know that a uh, uh, challenge of the to is to read out the soft breakdown current. And here, illustrate how how we going to be good. so for for these cases, we would have uh, two cases. One of the device will broke, and we will have a breakdown current. And also, in the other side, we still have some leakage current because these uh, devices are really small, so there is the oxide really thin, so there will be some leakage current as well. So the important thing is we want to distinguish the difference of this breakdown and leakage current. And the real case, how the, this uh, current looks like. So the right parts are the breakdown current, it shows as in the accumulated distribution function. And the left, left would be the leakage current. And what's important here is that you see the breakdown current is really, it's low, that can be down to nanoamps. And also there is a huge uh, voltage dependence. So it, this is in log scale, so it means that the currents are actually following an exponential uh, voltage dependence. And also it's widely distributed. There's almost 30 times difference between cells. So it would be hard to define a threshold to read out this current. So what we've seen is that we cannot use the conventional S, uh, sense amplifiers for SRAMs, or we cannot use the single ended sense amplifier for the anti-fuse memories. So we have to design our own sense amplifier, which is shown here. Uh, this is uh, the, the sense amplifier that we designed. We, it consists of a um, current mirror uh, input stage, which are in darker colors, and there's uh, followed by a uh, cross-couple pair uh, active loadings in the second stage. And what's uh, the, the feature of this one is it's capable to sense a really small current and it don't need a reference voltage and the differential structure is more better for to against such an attacks. 
and how will this work? So first phase, we as the clock rises, it will perform the reset fake reset operation, which reset the bin line and the bin line bar to zero, and the VL and VR to VDD, and the data will remain the same. And as clock falls, it would enter the readout phase. And for for example, <coughs> if the bin line current is uh, higher than bin line bar current, the, the, the voltage will grow higher for bin line and grows lower for bin line bar. And as well for the VL and the VR, it would drop to a different speed until a certain level. It would then stretch to to both to zero and one as it's uh, active loading, start a positive feedback, and then the data will change from one to zero in this case. And later on. If the clock rises, it will start a uh, different bar reading, so it will sample the data at this point. And so on, and we do again the reset and uh, another read, and it will give for different cells, it can give different different uh, data out. Okay. So I will show here. So here shows the, the test uh, chip structure and the ex experimental setup. So here I show the layout of this uh, circuit. And it consists of two path arrays in this in the same chip, and it shows the, the, the dimensions of the sensor modifier and uh, path cell. It's actually really, really compact, and they are fabricated in, in the 40 nanometer process, and they are packaged and measured using FPGAs, and also we put the chips inside the temperature chamber to measure the, for different temperatures. And so. He, Based on the, these measurements setup, we have found several experimental results shown here. So what's the most important is that uh, using this oxide breakdown based path, we have the bit error rates towards zero. As you see here, we measure the bit error rates in different <coughs> in different vote, operation voltages, and the bit error rate is approach zero for uh, up down to zero point eight volt. And if you, we go further lower, because the current really decreases too much, then it starts to have some errors. And unstable bits means the, the bits that gives you um, an error in all these uh, measurements, which is uh, yeah, also really small. It's also zero for, for, for these cases. And what's in, also important is that the, the error-free regions, as you see here, it covers the plus and minus 10% of the VDD, which is kind of the, the, the standards for, 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 for circuit designs. And because of these 0% uh, errors, we don't need any more hardware data for, for, for the path. And yeah, here it shows the, the zoom, we, how, how the, uh, the, um, the errors it changes uh, with the memoir measurement cycles, and it, what's important is that because the, the path cells have uh, wide variations, so so the as you see for some bits that doesn't show the unstable behavior until uh, more than thousand cycles. So actually, the, the cells are quite different, quite some variations between them. And also, there's a good stability against temperature variation. As we've seen here, for VDD equals to 0 0.9 volt, the nominal ones, the errors occurs only at 160 degrees Celsius, which is a really nice result. And But if we decrease the voltage, then the unstable behavior starts to occur uh, at lower temperature. So the path are a bit more sensitive to the temperature at lower VDD, which is reasonable because it's, uh, the current level is much lower. And in general, the stability is better at lower temperature, as we uh, see. And uh, on chip heaters, so, so the side note is that uh, we use an uh, on-chip heater to heat for, for 60 degrees Celsius in the bath because the, simply the, the, the cables cannot sustain that high temperature in our setup. So, so what we, can, we, we observe is that uh, this thermal stability is actually degraded by the sensor modifier because in our previous work we already measured in different temperatures and we've seen the, the 
the stability actually doesn't change for the different temperature because there's no bit flipping observed for different uh, for elevated temperatures. And also the readout window doesn't shrink, it actually grows a bit, a bit higher in the higher temperature. So we think that the pass cell is not really sensitive to temperature. So that's why we, we then simulate the, the sensible fire. <coughs> so here shows the uh, first uh, simulation on 25 the, the room temperature. And it gives uh, the correct readout of the, the data of, of uh, one, I think. But if we, if we increase the simulated temperature, we put it to 125 degrees Celsius. And then as you see here, the, the, the VL and the VR actually goes towards the, the different direction as the, the room temperature. So we have the incorrect switching caused by noise because at this point these two values are too close to each other. So that's why we, we conclude that the sensor is uh, the cause of the, the bad, uh, not really bad, but it's uh, the, the reason of degrading the thermal stability. And finally, we show the, the, the readiness and uniqueness. So the, the, the Hamming, normalized Hamming weight shows that uh, it more or less follows the, the ideal binomial distribution, which shows no bias. And the interchip Hamming distance, it follows also the, the ideal binomial distribution and has a uh, mean value really close to 0 0.5. So we have good readiness and uniqueness. And we also observe no special correlation, not really in this figure, but we calculate <coughs> the, the autocorrelation function, which shows <coughs> sorry. So the autocorrelation function shows uh, it's also close to ideal values, and the, all the data sequence passes the, the AIS thirty one uh, autocorrelation test which means there is no special correlation. And finally, I will conclude the work. So first, we compare it with some prior works. So we took a few designs, basically uh, from these designs are focusing on the 0% beta array approach. And we also show some more classical, one more classical path designs using uh, uh, process variations. And what's important is that we see that in most of the, the in these other designs, they are also still showing some points that is not really good. For example, in the the first design, the, the Hamming distance is apart from 0.5, so it has not an ideal uniqueness. And for the these middle two designs, they are having much higher uh, energy consumption. So yeah. And for the, the other ones, that of course it don't because it's not, it's a, a more classical design. It doesn't have the the, the zero percent beta rate. So uh, that if we see only the, the this index, we would like we, we will conclude maybe this work is the most robust uh, design. But if we consider more on the security point of view and uh, and to consider the energy consumptions, we will have to say that we our work is the best solution uh, among all these index. So yeah, then that uh, brings us to the conclusion. Uh, so we have demonstrated a highly stable path using soft breakdown in CMOS. And uh, soft breakdown has a narrower operating range rather than hard breakdown, but it's more power efficient and it's more immune to, to invasive attacks. And the readiness and uniqueness are close to the ideal values. So yeah, so it's the end of the talk. And I would like to thank uh, Arthur and Bohan to help me on the on the measurement setups, and I'm really happy. Yeah, it's glad for, for your help. And uh, thanks for your listen for the attention, and I would happy to answer any questions.